Good morning and welcome to This Week. Washington fails. I should somehow do a Jedi mind meld and convince them to do what's right. It's about taking on the spending problem here in Washington. The sequester kicks in, sweeping cuts in spending. How long will they stick? What impact will they have? Answers today from our headliners, including top White House aide Gene Sperling, who tangled this week with legendary reporter Bob Woodward. It was uh, said very clearly, you will regret doing this. Plus our powerhouse roundtable on all the week's politics. Buona notte. Stunning change for the Catholic Church. And in this week's biggest surprise. I love him, the guy's awesome. Dennis Rodman meets Kim Jong-un. No American has spent more time with North Korea's new dictator, and he joins us for his first interview. From ABC News, this week with George Stephanopoulos. Reporting from ABC News headquarters, George Stephanopoulos. You heard that right. In the week's most surreal encounter, one of the world's most notorious basketball players spent quality time with one of the world's most dangerous dictators. And Dennis Rodman is here to share what he learned about Kim Jong-un in just a bit. But we begin with the budget battles that have crippled the Capitol. President Obama signed the order on Friday to execute those $85 billion in across-the-board spending cuts. And with both sides locked into their positions, it looks like those cuts are here to stay. For more on what that will all mean, we begin today with the president's top economic advisor, director of the National Economic Council, Gene Sperling. Good morning, Gene. Thanks for joining us. It's very Thank clear, you, George. very clear from Speaker Boehner, the leader of the Senate Republicans, Mitch McConnell, that the Republicans are not moving on taxes. taxes. So does that mean these cuts are going to be in place for the rest of the year? You know, I certainly hope not, George. These were harsh cuts that were put into place to be so harsh on defense and national security, on education, on uh, uh, you know, things that matter to children in our country, uh, and most of all to jobs, that it was considered to be so harsh that it would force both sides to come back to the table and negotiate on the type of bipartisan compromise but that's not happening. everyone knows we need. Well, you know, George, uh, it hasn't happened yet, but I will tell you something. Uh, this is not a win for Republicans. You know, Republicans are supposed to be for stronger national defense. This cuts our military preparedness dramatically. They're supposed to be for border security. These sequester cuts will end up meeting enough reduction in hours that would be the equivalent of 5,000 border patrol uh, agents being cut. They're supposed to be for long-term entitlement reform. This does no long-term entitlement reform. And when I talk to CEOs around the country, they tell me that this is leading them to put projects that would create jobs on hold. They think it's going to hurt their small business suppliers dramatically. So this is not a win for anyone. The only win, if you can call it that, that this gives is the, those on the Republican side who are willing to let all this harm be inflicted but just so they can stand by this principle that there should not be one dime of deficit reduction but as you that know, should the Republican ever come leaders, from closing loopholes or deductions. That's just a, an unreasonable position. As you know, the Republican leaders say that's not the only option, that they say the administration could cushion the blow of these cuts if it wanted to. Here's, uh, here's Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell just the other day. The president is ready to make it bite as hard as possible, all to send a simple message to the public. <laughs> you want to control Washington spending America? Fine, let me show you how much I can make it hurt. Why not take the kind of flexibility the Republicans are offering? Because I think that, as you've heard independent economists say, from the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, to the independent Congressional Budget Office, there is no way that you can move the, the deck chairs around in a way that will not cost our economy, as CBO projects, 750,000 jobs. When you have those type of harsh spending cuts in such a short, concentrated period of time, uh, it's like saying to somebody, you can cut off three of your fingers, but you can have the flexibility to choose which ones you want to cut off. If you're cutting $42 billion from defense, uh, you're going to dramatically hurt operations and maintenance and our military training. If you have to cut as much as is required on, uh, uh, on the domestic side, you could eliminate Head Start, the FBI, and the National Science Foundation, and you still would not get there. Now, you know, if they want to talk about real flexibility that would allow the president to actually reduce the deficit in a way that didn't hurt jobs, and most importantly, to be able to reduce 
loopholes, corporate tax expenditures, tax expenditures for the well-off uh, in a way that didn't hurt jobs, that would be one thing. But what they're saying is the only way that we can do cuts are in very harsh, devastating ways that would cost 750,000 jobs and that their flexibility does not include the ability to ask for one dime of revenues you, to lower the deficit from corporate loopholes, even though, George, it was only 10 weeks ago that Speaker Boehner said that we could reduce the deficit by up to $1 trillion from exactly this type of tax reform that closes loopholes and reduces tax As you know, Gene, even the president's allies have accused the administration of hyping the pain caused by these cuts. Here's New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. There's a lot of posturing. I'm going to lay off my employees today unless you do something. I'm going to, uh, uh, we're going to close the hospitals down. We're going to put, take all the prisoners from jail and put them on the streets. Spare me. I live in that world. I mean, come on, let's get serious here. And at least twice this week, the administration got caught exaggerating the impact. The president claimed the Capitol janitors are going to get a pay cut. Uh, the architect of the Capitol denied that. It said it was a premature at best. Education Secretary Arne Ducker couldn't, Duncan couldn't back up a similar claim that he made about teachers getting pink slips. So how do you respond to critics who say the administration is engaging in scare tactics? Well, you know, first of all, uh, you know, those Capitol janitors will not get as much overtime. I'm sure they think less pay that they're taking home uh, does hurt. But I think the real issue uh, is that this is, as the president said, a slow grind. Uh, when this sequester goes off, yes, it's not going to hurt as much on day one. But again, every independent economist agrees it is going to cost our economy 750,000 jobs just as our economy has a chance to take off. George, you could bring CEO after CEO on your show who would tell you that this type of uncertainty and dysfunction in Washington is forcing them to hold back projects that they would be doing that would be creating jobs. They're worried it's going to hurt their small business suppliers. And as, and my belief is that as this pain starts to gradually spread to communities Communities affected by military spending, to children who need mental health services, uh, uh, to uh, uh, people who care about our border security. I believe that more Republican colleagues who are concerned about this harm to their constituents will choose bipartisan compromise on revenue raising tax reform with serious entitlement reform. They'll choose this bipartisan compromise over what is an ideological position that every single penny of deficit reduction going forward must be on the middle class or seniors or children and that there can't be one penny that comes from closing loopholes or tax expenditures. That is not a position that the public supports. It's not the kind of bipartisan compromise we need to move our country forward. Before you go, I have to ask you about this strange sparring match you had with Bob Woodward of the Washington Post this week. I guess it began with an email exchange that you had about an article he wrote last week in the Washington Post saying the president was moving the goalposts on the sequester. I guess you had a heated conversation, and in an email you apologized for it and then went on to add this. You say, as a friend, I think you'll regret staking out that claim. Woodward seemed to take it as a threat. Listen. It makes me very uncomfortable to have the White House telling reporters uh, you're going to regret doing something that you believe in. I read all the emails. They seem pretty civil on all sides. Do you have any idea what made Woodward so uncomfortable? And have you all spoken about it since and cleared this all up? You know, George, I've known Bob Woodward for 20 years. We've had a very friendly and respectful relationship. I think virtually everybody who has looked at my email to him and his reply to me thought those emails reflected that degree of respect and, and politeness. Uh, and the emails were fundamentally substantive. I was, I was arguing a case as to why I believe the president asking for balance is consistent with where things have been for the last several years. So... All I can say, George, is that uh, uh, Bob Woodward is, is a legend. Uh, uh, I hope that him and I can put this behind us. And I think most So you haven't talked about it yet? You know, I haven't talked to him yet, but I hope to. I, I hope we can put it behind us because I think we both care about the policy issues we were debating. And I think we both think that that's where the focus of our, our national debate should be, not on, not on our email exchange. Gene Sperling, thanks for your time this morning. Thank you, George.